Welcome to the Weather Nation podcast, episode seven. I'm Dakota Smith, alongside Meredith Garfala. Meredith, thanks for doing this again. Yay! Second, second <laughs> hosting experience here. I'm um, excited to, to dive in. We're going to talk about some of the top weather stories. Uh, we have a California big storm coming on the coast, and then the next snowstorm coming up this week and next week. There are actually a few systems we're looking at. Uh, I'm going to do some more trivia. Oh, no. <laughs> I, I did not do well trivia last time. You're going to do great. Okay, You're going to do great. Uh, we have an interview with Dr. Tracy Fanara, so stick around for that because that was an awesome interview. I had a really good time. Uh, with that. But first, some housekeeping. Um, if you're listening right now on Apple Podcasts, rate and review this show. We'll give you a shout out on the show. Last week we actually had someone rate and we, we gave him a shout out on the show. So it was a lot of fun. Um, if you have any weather or climate questions, send us an email at podcast at weathernationtv.com or just tweet us at weathernation. Cool. That takes yeah. care of housekeeping. There we go. We got it done in we, one we got, fell Got to get out of the way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, top of the stories. This oh. California storm it hits sort of close to home for you because you that was your uh, your old um, audience area. It's bringing tons of rain and snow to Southern California. Uh, on Monday, they shut down road rays because of the snow. And today, there's on Tuesday, there's been a mudslide and debris flow threat. Uh, this is your old stomping grounds. What are you watching with the storm? So definitely the rain rates. I know we talk sometimes about, oh, one to three inches, but you have to remember if you're getting the one to three inches within a short period of time, like within 15 to 20 minutes to a half an hour, it's like taking a bucket of water, for example, and dumping it on a slide. It's going to race down there. It's going to spread out because some of these recent burn scar areas, there really hasn't been a lot of regrowth, a lot of vegetation. It's still been very dry. And so it is just going to race through any area and we were uh, talking about the power of water it picks up mud it picks up rocks I mean if we go back to the one year ago and we had the mudslide in Montecito it was a very similar situation we had a recent burn scar area we had heavy rain coming down and rain rates that were astronomically high uh, and as a result, we did have that mudslide, which was unfortunately claimed the life of, I believe, 23 people with still a couple people missing. And so anytime we're talking about flash flood watches, there's a good difference between the watch and the warning. A watch means be prepared, know where to go if you have to evacuate, know your escape route, maybe get your kit ready. Warning means take action now, flooding is imminent or it's about to occur or it's already happening. And that's when you need to get out or get to higher ground, whatever you can safely do. That's a good reminder. Um, always, always a good reminder between watch and warning. Uh, I saw some imagery just on Tuesday of a, a mud or debris flow actually going into someone's house, basically, and they had to tape it off. Uh, so we'll be watching this. Hopefully, we don't see uh, more images like that. Um, we have a few storm systems uh, after this one that are going to sort of cut through the middle of the country, bring some snow to places that already saw snow. Um, and right after that, over the weekend, looks like we're going to have this sort of plunge of, of really cold air uh, just in time for some of the playoff games this weekend. Oh, no. Yeah. That's, that's not good because you get all excited about going to the games. Right. <laughs> but then when you're sitting outside and the wind chill is below zero, it's no fun. It's no, it's no fun. Yeah. You definitely need a lot of hot chocolate. Do you, so you've been, I know you've been tracking this for a little bit. Is, do you see a sweet zone of where people might get the most snow or areas that we should just should be watching this week? The nice thing about this storm system, if we're going to be positive here and look for the silver lining, is it's not looking as of right now to dump as much snow as we just saw. Washington, D.C., for example, at the airport, uh, the Reagan Airport got around 10 inches of snow from this last storm system. This one with the current models, we're still days out, but it does look like between one to three inches, maybe three to four inches on the higher side. Uh, but the totals are not as high as last time. We're also going to see that rain a lot higher north than what we saw with this last storm system. So some places that might have seen snow last week, you'll have rain this week. But then there's always that freezing line, and a big concern is going to be ice accumulation because that, that'll shut down the city. Even a little as tenth of an inch can do damage. Yeah, and on the warm side, it actually looks like there's going to be some severe potential uh, in the deep south. So we'll be keeping an eye on that. Meredith, did I miss anything? Top oh, there is a threat. This is a f interesting because we don't normally talk about it, but there's a threat with this same system producing the flash flood threat 
also for severe weather. Yep. The dynamics are going to be there where we could get a few thunderstorms that pop up, which could produce water spouts. And when I worked in California, I remember being on the air for a tornado warning and everybody who is from California or lived in California, they really were, what do we do? Like, yeah, they yeah. looked to me to tell them, what do we do for a tornado warning? Because they rarely happen. But you have to remember, a lot of times those water spouts, if they're powerful, if they're strong enough, they come ashore. And the minute that they hit land, they become a tornado. And even a weak tornado it can do, it can do a, a good number on the coastline. Yeah, so we'll be keeping an, an eye on that threat as well as uh, some of the threats, threats later this week and this weekend. Okay, John Van Pelt up next has our weekly safety tip of the week. Yeah, hey Dakota, this week we are talking about winter safety for senior citizens. Uh, and there's some pretty important things we can do to help uh, make life better for seniors in the winter time. One, seniors should avoid driving when road conditions are at their worst. Uh, they need to be prepared for bad conditions that they do have to drive. And you, of course, should, as everybody should have, uh, some supplies in the car like blankets and food and water just in case you get stranded. Now, falls are a big problem, too, for senior citizens. We do not want to break hips because that can often lead to worse things. Uh, slips on ice are a major hazard. So if uh, senior citizens have to go outside, very important to wear shoes or boots with good traction and be very careful in snow and icy condition, like keep the walkways, driveways, and pathways clear of ice and snow. Frostbite and hypothermia is a big deal, too, for all of us, and that can be worse for senior citizens. So uh, make sure uh, that seniors head out dressed warmly, and even inside hypothermia can be a problem if it gets too cold. So it's good to keep the thermostats at at least 65 degrees. Also, it's flu season, so if you haven't had a flu shot, everybody should get a flu shot, and that's especially important for senior citizens. Another important thing to keep in mind is in the wintertime, we can all get SAD. Uh, SAD actually stands for Seasonal Affective Disorder. That can affect a lot of people because of the lack of light in the wintertime. So for senior citizens, we want to make sure we allow extra light to get into the house. And also, just in case uh, dementia might be a, a problem, the lack of light can also affect sundowner syndromes. So these are just a couple of things to keep in mind so seniors can be safer in the wintertime. And that's this week's tip of the week. Dakota, I'll toss it back to you. John, thank you so much. Uh, I I love his tips. We have we have them on air <laughs> too, and it's just like the best thing ever. Um, so thank you so much uh, for bringing a new one every week. He keeps it fresh. Um, okay, it's time for trivia. All right. This is my favorite part. You love stumping people. I let, love stumping let people. Let me put it out there. Yeah. He likes to stump people. So if you're stumped, you're not alone, because I'm with you. Some of the other Mets are really really good at trivia. I'm better at acting it out. I would be better at charades if we did charades instead of okay, trivia. Okay, we can maybe do that. Although, tough for a podcast. Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, we could shoot some video. We we'll figure it out. We, <laughs> uh, yeah, last week I stumped uh, Nick pretty bad at the end there. <laughs> he, he was doing good. and then uh, You know what we need to do? We need to flip the script. We need to trump, you guys. To, stump, to, yeah. to trump. To trump you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because I don't think I would do very well, honestly. I'm not great at trivia, even though I do it every week at, like, at a brewery. Sure. Anyways. Okay, as we've been talking about, Southern California is getting hammered with rain and snow. On Monday, Los Angeles recorded exactly an inch of rain, not coming close to the single-day rainfall record of 5.88 inches back in 1938. But my question for you is, on average, how often does L.A. see a 2-inch-plus single-day rain event? Multiple choice. Okay, good. <laughs> Covering my answers. A, four times a year. B, three times a year, C, twice a year, or D, once a year? That's definitely a really good question because typically we have not seen a lot of rain, so I'm definitely on the lower end. Um, you know, I'm going to go with one inch. Once a year? Once a year. Or mm -hmm. sorry, <laughs> you can tell it's the beginning of the week and I need <laughs> more coffee, but yes, once a year. Nailed it. Yes! Good job. Once a year, since 1989, L.A. has seen exactly 32-plus inch rain events, aver averaging to one such event every year. Great job. Thank you. That, that was good. I, I thought I was going to get you on that one. Okay. <laughs> okay, this is a wild card question okay. that I, this weekend, I was watching some TV, and I was like, I'm going to put that in the show. So nothing to do with the weather right now. All right. Over the weekend, I happened to catch Toy Story 3. Great movie, by the way. Tears me up every time. 
Um, I noticed that at the end of the movie of Toy Story 3, there were some puffy cumulus clouds at the end. That's how it ends. Um, this made me wonder, did any other Toy Story uh, movies end like this? Because there's three of them total. So I checked, and Toy Story 2 doesn't have okay. weather at the end. It has it in the middle, some clouds in the middle. But Toy Story, the original, ha does. Hmm. And it ends sort of in a similar fashion, but with a different type of weather. So my question to you is, what is that weather? <laughs> I haven't seen Toy Story like since I watched it with my little cousins like years ago. Oh come on, you got you got to keep up on the Pixar. I know. Uh, now that I'm getting trivia from you, that's for sure. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> A was it more puffy cumulus clouds like Toy Story three? Uh, B a snowy winter wonderland. C a rainy washout. Or D a whirly water spout that came ashore and tosses all the toys into the sky. That would be really cool to end <laughs> from a meteorological standpoint, but sad for all the toys. Um, what was A, B, and C? A was puffy clouds, B was snow, C was rain. I'm going to go with rain. Gotcha. Oh, is it snow? It's snow. Oh, yeah. I was going to go with the other it's one. It's snow, <laughs> yeah. Uh, although it ends with a fairly peaceful winter wonderland, the toys aren't so happy at the end when they find out at the last second that Andy is getting a dog. And for toys, it's gotcha. not a great thing. I wish um, my little cousins were here for a lifeline. I bet they would it, honestly. <laughs> I'm going to do more Pixar uh, trivia because they, they like to do a lot of stuff with like weather, I've noticed. I need to watch now. <laughs> like Up? Up would be a great one because um, they actually talk about clouds and Up. Anyways, sidetrack. Cool. Um, okay, final, final trivia question. The current temperature forecast for kickoff of the Chiefs-Patriots Patriots game is hovering around zero degrees. Ugh. While it's going to be a bone-chilling game, it won't set the record for coldest football game ever. What stadium was home to the Ice Bowl commonly recognized as the coldest football game ever. So you're looking for the stadium. The stadium, yeah. okay. Okay, so A, Lambeau Field in Green Bay, Wisconsin. B, Gillette Stadium in Foxborough, Massachusetts. C, U.S. Bank Stadium in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Or D, Stark Field in Winterfell, Westeros, home to star player and comeback king Jon Snow. I think it's definitely going to be Minnesota or Green Bay. And I'm just because I'm thinking of location to break down the two. I love football. I'm from Cleveland, so I'm a Browns fan, but I'm also a Broncos fan now that I live here in Denver. Um, Before you decide, pick, I'm going to give you a hint. There's a there's a trick question part of this. There's a trick question part of it. Well, hopefully, I process of elimination was good. The ice bowl. I'm going to go with Green Bay. That's my gut. Nailed it. Yay! Good job. I'm better this well, week. Well, <laughs> two out of three. That's really good. Uh, so the trick question part of it is that U.S. Bank Stadium is inside. Oh. Yeah, so that was kind of me just trying to see if you need stadiums. I probably wouldn't have gotten that either. Um, <laughs> and obviously, Stark Field is not real. Um, I was going to say, if it's Tony Stark's field, then the Avengers <laughs> are was, coming in. <laughs> that was a Game of Thrones uh, oh, it was? reference. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. And John. here I am thinking of the event. I just watched the Avengers the other night, so that's probably why. All right, I'll bring some Marvel trivia next yes, time. So uh, cool. We'll see how it goes. Good job. Two out of Thank three. Thank you. Well, I'm improving every week, so I'm going to take that as a positive. Yeah, no, it was really good. Um, so up you were good, too, because you stumped me. Was <laughs> once. i got to get that, get that up. Um, so coming up next, we have our interview with Dr. Tracy Fanara. Uh, we can't wait for you to hear it. Stay with us. You're listening to the Weather Nation podcast. To tune into more Weather Nation coverage, you can watch live programming on Amazon Fire, Roku, and any of your favorite streaming services. Okay, welcome back to the Weather Nation podcast. Uh, we're joined now by Dr. Tracy Fanara, Program Manager and Staff Scientist at the Moat Marine Laboratory. Uh, Tracy, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's super exciting to be here. I love Weather Nation. <laughs> um, yeah, we've been so grateful for all of the Skypes that you've done with us on air during uh, some of the peak of the red tide. I was wondering if you could give us a little bit of background on yourself and your work and your, uh, yeah, just education, all that jazz. So I'm from Buffalo, New York. And I got into the environmental field because I am from Buffalo and I, in fourth grade, I think it was around 10, I learned about this hazardous waste dump site where industries were dumping toxic waste that was leaching into the soil and groundwater and moving off site. And then people started building schools and houses 
and then there were cancer clusters and birth defects. And I learned at a very early age how how we're all connected, how our inputs to the environment eventually come back to affect our health. And that's what started this journey um, and then ended up at the University of Florida. I got all three of my degrees there. I was actually a transfer student from Hobart. My parents told me I could only go an hour and a half away from home for school, and then they moved to Florida. So as soon as I got in-state tuition, I went to the, in my opinion, the best school in the world. Um, And I got my bachelor's degree from there, and I went and worked in the field as a project engineer, saw how uh, mismanaged our land was as far as development goes. So I went back to school to prove that there was a better way, a more sustainable way to Um, to build and develop without making these huge changes to the water cycle. And uh, yeah, upon graduation with my PhD, I uh, took the first job that allowed me to connect communication with research. And that's where I am now at at Mount Marine Laboratory. We've had you on a lot here to talk about the red tide and when these big events happen in the Gulf Coast. Could you give our listeners just a brief sort of introduction to what the red tide is and what causes it? Right, so Florida red tide is specific to the Gulf of Mexico. It's a species of phytoplankton. The name is Karenia brevis. So Florida red tide is a common name for Karenia brevis brevis, or blooms of Karenia brevis. So we get 70% of our oxygen from phytoplankton. One to 2% of those phytoplankton are harmful, meaning that they release a toxin that can cause harm to aquatic life. And Florida red tide is is one of those species. Karenia brevis is one of those species. And in large quantities, it can not only cause massive fish kills and wildlife fatalities, dolphins, shark, turtles, manatee, uh, but also what makes Florida red tide toxin called brevitoxin so special is that it, when it's released, it can attach on sea salt particles in the air and move on shore with winds causing respiratory irritation or coughing in healthy individuals. But for those with asthma or COPD, this can be very serious. And these aerosols can transport as far as eight miles inland, possibly even further. So it, it really is a public health threat and affects everything from recreation to economy. So so this bloom in particular has been very intense and although not unprecedented, it is unique in the sense that that it's been going on for so long and it is and it has caused so much wildlife fatality. We've been watching this on both coasts. Uh, First the West Coast, then we had a little bit on the East Coast. Now it's back on the West Coast. Has the weather played any role in the movement of the red tide? Is it helping? Is it hurting? So the weather plays a huge role in red tide currents have the some of the biggest impact on where blooms go after after they have initiated. Um, It's thought that blooms occur or initiate 10 to 40 miles offshore at the ocean bottom and rise to the top because of currents and upwelling. And from there, the currents, the weather patterns kind of dictate where this goes. Now we had some really strong Southern movement uh, bringing the, the Florida red tide bloom that has existed since October, 2017. Uh, in about October, 2018, Southern movements brought that, that bloom to the south far enough that the it was picked up by the Florida Loop Current and the Gulf Stream and came up the East Coast. Now this has only happened eight times in the past and only twice has it gotten north of Florida. This time it did not go north of Florida, but we did see it on the East Coast for a few weeks. Um, but it has remained in the Gulf of Mexico on the West Coast, Southwest, um, for the majority of the time. We have had um, some bloom up on the Panhandle uh, in, say, September and October. Uh, it, it was stood Hurricane Michael. I was very surprised to see that hurricane come into a location where we had high cell counts of Karenia brevis and that bloom remain. Uh, and there's a couple different ideas or thoughts as to why that bloom remained. It could be that there was a forced upwelling uh, when that when Michael came through, or it could have been that the amount of runoff and nutrients brought to the coastline uh, was more played more of a role in continuing the bloom than the turbulence did in lysing those cells. 
So a um, number of things could have happened. Uh, hopefully we'll, we'll, with our data collection and forecasting prediction, we'll have a clear idea of these events and how red tide blooms can be impacted. Yeah, I didn't even, sorry, I didn't even think about Michael and the red tide interacting. Is that like an active area of research right now or is, is it something we still don't know a lot about? Yeah, um, so NASA and NOAA made a connection between hurricane events and really long red tide blooms back in 2004. They looked at the 90s, they looked at the four hurricanes that we had before an 18 month bloom in 2004, five and six. And now we saw Irma this year preceding a really long bloom. So there has been that connection between hurricane events and Florida red tide bloom for a while now. Uh, as far as understanding what happens when a hurricane comes and whether whether that bloom will withstand or exacerbate or stay the same or dissipate, because we've seen it all happen with hurricane events. Um, that's something that we're looking more into. I had my my interns this past summer build a hurricane simulator. So we were trying to look at what kind of shear stresses um, and wind velocity are necessary for that cell lysing. And that's something that we're looking into further. That's really interesting. I don't think a lot of people put the two and two together. I mean, we talk a lot about the red tide and um, some of the areas that have been hardest hit. And, and for those that may not be familiar, it, it has actually taken a huge toll on Florida economy for the, especially the West Coast beaches. Yes, it absolutely has. Uh, fishermen, hotels, uh, even real estate at this point. So um, everybody's concerned about it, which it's kind of made it and made environment a nonpartisan topic, uh, which is amazing to see that that finally environment is coming to the forefront, crossing cultural, political lines, um, it, it, which is where it should be. And so it sounds like it has a large impact. Are there policies in place that are trying to prevent this event from happening in future years? That's a really good question. And a lot of people ask how we can prevent these blooms. And if we would, if we could. So Florida red tide is a native species. We know that it's been around for hundreds of years. There were anecdotal reports in the 1500s and official reports in the 1800s. So we know that it plays some kind of role in the ecosystem. Now, there's a lot of questions as to what that role is, but a lot of scientists hypothesize that the role is to reset the ecosystem, keep out invasive um, and exotic species, and reset the natural uh, ecosystem. Uh, and so if we were able to get rid of red tide, that's the question, would we? Now, to control, mitigate, and lessen our impacts, which exacerbate this naturally occurring phenomenon, that's where, that's where policies can come into place. And right now, there are many counties looking into fertilizer bans, for, ex for example, especially during the rainy season, um, so that see, Crania brevis can use over 12 different forms of nutrients. So it doesn't need that readily accessible surface water nutrients, but it can absolutely use it. Um, so trying to limit the amount of nutrients that we have coming to our coastlines, uh, limit uh, any kind of septic, septic tank leakage um, and fertilizer runoff. Uh, those are some things that counties and cities are looking into eliminating uh, as much as possible now. And I know you're passionate about other things that are science related, including recycling. You've done a lot of work on reusing and recycling water, which is a big deal. Why is this a passion of yours and why do you feel this is an important technology moving forward that we need to focus on? Well, I just think water hydrologic restoration in general is essential to keep in mind and, and when we're developing or when anything, you know, water basically rules the world. It, it's our life source, but it can also, you know, move land to make mountains and, and destroy and destruct and respecting water and the water cycle, the natural water cycle is something that we have to do to survive on this earth. Um, so... So my passion is really kind of restoring that natural water cycle, allowing water to be naturally infiltrated and treated by um, microbes and physical uh, characteristics of soil. Um, and then also innovating new technologies to retrofit already existing urban environments so that we can make the water cycle look 
like nothing is built on top of it. And that's something that that I worked on for my uh, dissertation research was basically it's called low impact development retrofit. It's taking an urban environment and trying to mimic that natural water cycle and you know, re recycling water, the ability to clean water, um, to reuse it again is something that's, that's really important right now. Even financial institutions are noting that, that water really is the future, um, as far as, uh, value that's all, only going to increase, um, with a growing population and decreasing water quality and decreasing freshwater sources. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, I can go on forever about water. <laughs> I, was, I was scrolling through your Twitter and looking at all the cool things that you're doing. It looks like you get out in the field a lot and explore parts of Florida. I, I'm jealous. It looks a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, are there any other environmental issues or uh, impacts in Florida that, that you think are, are super important right now? Yeah, I mean, for example, um, you know, I always go back to urbanization because that is really where we're changing our ecosystem. And as far as, you know, wastewater overflows are a big, are a big thing right now. We have, we have non-combined sewers, which means that our stormwater and our wastewater are completely separate. Our stormwater, every single drop of rain that falls on the state of Florida goes to a natural water body. So everything that we're putting on our lawns is essential. You know, we're, we're putting endocrine disruptors, not only in our bodies, but also on the land, our pesticides, our insecticides, herbicides, all of that is going to our natural water bodies down into our drinking water sources. And then we have to trust that our, you know, water treatment facilities are taking care of that. And you're not exempt from that by buying bottled water. Uh, they actually have lower requirements on, on water treatment than the municipalities. So just, you know, keeping in mind everything that we're putting out into the environment, um, you know, we have those the, on top of it because we have already exceeded the amount that we can put into our wastewater systems. Now we're building new septic systems, which septic systems have a number of, of issues with seepage and leaking and those toxins and nutrients coming back through the groundwater into our into our water sources. So all of it together, you know, we have such a fragile environment here. We have so much rainfall. So we have flooding, sea level rise. Uh, climate change has a big impact down here. Uh, gosh, uh, biodiversity, we have exotic species, the pythons taking over the Everglades. Uh, then we, <laughs> I mean, we, we have so much, you know, and then when we talk about the Everglades and, um, you know, a lot of people's wish to restore the flow from Lake Okeechobee, that's the Lake Okeechobee overflows have been a big deal throughout this whole red tide bloom too, because I don't know if you guys know there was a dual bloom going on. So we were in a water crisis, not only because of that Florida red tide bloom off the Gulf Coast, but also because of a freshwater bloom that included a, a harmful species of freshwater cyanobacteria called microcystis, which releases a toxin called microcystin. Um, so that was a big deal too. And that sparked after we had something called Lake Okeechobee overflows. So basically in the state of Florida, uh, when settlers first came here, it was really wet you know, south of Lake Okeechobee. Lake Okeechobee is this big lake in the middle of the state. And south of Lake Okeechobee it was, was all swampland. So when people moved to Florida, they built a dam south of Lake Okeechobee so that they can farm and, and live there. Uh, however, <laughs> this wasn't the way the, the natural hydrology was. A hurricane came through in like 1928, the dam broke, thousands of people lost their lives. So the federal government was called in to solve the problem and that they did. They prevented flooding by any time there was a lot of rainfall, they would back plump into Lake Okeechobee. Lake Okeechobee would hit a stage height where that water is released to two points, uh, one to the east called St. Lucie River and one to the west, west called the Caloosahatchee River. Now, when these overflows happen, a lot of times the water did not have enough detention time for biological, chemical, and physical degradation and pollutants. So you had these, this surge of nutrients, and that's where these freshwater cyanobacteria blooms would occur because freshwater blooms are, are directly connected to, to human activity, to those nutrient loads. It's not like uh, Florida red tide where it's been around forever. Um, so 
so because of that, you know, the public really got involved. Uh, and that's the first thing our new governor is apparently working on is preventing those those flows. But a lot of people see that restoring that flow from Lake Okeechobee South is the way to do it. The only problem is the sugar plantations are in the way. Um, so that's where a lot of the controversy comes comes along. I just have one more real quick question, because uh, you and I have talked about this a lot as um we're big supporters of STEM careers for women, and I know you've been a leader in that. I've done a lot of work in that as well. And why, you know, why is it so important for women like ourselves, for scientists across the country to come together and help educate and encourage more women to get into these STEM fields? I mean, it's a topic more recently that we're really trying to work hard on giving these girls wings to go out there and to kick butt in every STEM career field that they can. Right. And the reason why it's so important is because diversity, male, female, cultural, uh, every, just diversity in general is so important to move things forward. So much research has been done to show that diverse teams working together are more effective, more efficient than those that are not diverse. And that's why it's so important that we get more women involved in STEM fields. And that we make them realize at a young age that they can. You know, we have these societal norms. Girls are supposed to play with dolls and boys are supposed to play with Legos. And that's just, we teach them from a young age that that's what they're supposed to do. And that's what they feel, that's all they feel like they can do. And we really need to change that from a young age. Great, that's, that's a great note to end on, great message to end on. Uh, Dr. Tracy Fanara, thank you so, so much for joining us today. And for our listeners, where can they find you on Twitter, Facebook, wherever you are? Uh, give yourself a plug. Inspector Planet. That's where I am. Gotcha. Or, <laughs> yes, and come visit uh, Moat Marine Laboratory and Aquarium, and I'll be there too. Wonderful. Well, thanks again. We really appreciate you taking some time to chat with us. Anytime. And that's going to do it for Episode 7 of the Weather Nation podcast. Subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening right now so we show up in your feed in for future episodes. If you liked any of the video or audio clips that we played, you can find the full versions on our TV programming or weathernationtv.com. And as always, thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next week.